This is Power Hour with Gabriella Power. Hello and welcome to Power Hour. We are 75 days away from the US election and the game is about to change. Independent candidate RFK Jr. will suspend his campaign on Friday and he's set to endorse Donald Trump, according to reports from NBC News. It's being reported there are ongoing talks between the two camps after RFK Jr. and his running mate, Nicole Shanahan, made it crystal clear they're looking at joining forces with Trump. So what will this do to Trump's campaign? He's almost certainly in for a boost. But what does this move say about the Democratic Party, where it's at at the moment and the direction it's heading? It's fascinating. RFK Jr., who is the son of Robert Francis Kennedy, a Democrat running for president until his assassination in 1968, is going to throw his support behind Republican candidate Donald Trump. Why would he do that? Is it because the Democratic Party that's offering Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz at this election has moved so far to the left, it's no longer the party it once was? The Democratic National Convention is underway in Chicago and the Democrats rolled out their biggest stars, Michelle and Barack Obama, who are trying to emulate part of Obama's 2008 campaign around hope as if Kamala Harris wasn't in office already. A familiar feeling that's been buried too deep for far too long. You know what I'm talking about. It's the contagious power of hope. Joining us now from Los Angeles is Emily Wilson, the host of Emily Saves America. Emily, it is brilliant to speak with you. There's so much to get through, especially with what's coming out of the DNC. We've heard from the Obamas, who are, of course, brilliant speakers, but there was some real gaslighting there. I want to get your thoughts. What stood out to you? Yeah, it's funny. I was just making content and reviewing the clip, but it's so funny. I love... OK, this is going to be... <laughs> This is going to be an interesting statement. I don't care what the ex-president's wife has to say, who in reality has accomplished close to nothing. Mm -hmm. I know she's riding the hope train. It's just when our country is in the state that it's in and people's lives are on the line and people are dying every single day from the fentanyl coming into our country and immigration, which has criminals coming over our borders and active terrorist groups. Uh, the last thing I care about is, you know, your husband's hope that you're pursuing, which Obama was, uh, in my opinion, not a great president at all. Most people agree in this space with me, but it's so funny. The entire speech is complete gaslighting because they know that the crowd that they're talking to in general is very easy to manipulate. Mm -hmm. They forget the past in two seconds and in general are mostly very low IQ when they aren't the groups of people that are paid for. When she's talking about hope, this is the time right now where people have the least amount of hope because they're in danger and they can't afford anything because the current administration. She also goes on to talk about Donald Trump and his financial situation. Yes, of course, Donald Trump was born into some money. He also is a great businessman, which made money. He's also the only president to actually not take a salary, but to lose money. So it's funny to hear her in her, you know, uh, her millions and millions and millions of dollars of real estate talk about how he's corrupt, which is obviously, I wonder where all their money came from. It's just gaslighting. It's it works on their audience. Uh, absolutely. Not only did the audience forget about the past, they forget about the present. It's crazy when you hear people say, we want to vote for Kamala because we want change, as if she's not currently the vice president of the United States. I want to get into what Kamala Harris had to say in a moment, but I have to play you this clip because it's just so awkward. I couldn't look away. It's Nancy Pelosi in the crowd as uh, Joe Biden is speaking and everyone is chanting how much they love the president. Emily, I actually feel uncomfortable for Nancy Pelosi in that moment. Of course, she was part of the coup to, to oust Joe Biden just a month ago. But here she is in the crowd cheering. We love Joe Biden. It's so funny because as a Republican, I was in New York at my girlfriend's house and we were all sitting around and we watched the debate. And afterwards, I was like, I have never in my life 
seen all these people who said anyone that said Joe Biden wasn't in perfect health, even though he's literally falling over and giving speeches about, you know, things that have never happened. And one day he's Persian, the next he's black, then, you know, his Irish ancestry, all these things. They're mm. the first ones to go after you if you said that his mental health was in decline at all. And then look how fast these people throw their own candidate under the bus. I mean, literally right after the bait, they all were like, yeah, no, he's not fit to serve. He's got to go. And she was one of them. But like, like I said, unlike our party, this party has no loyalty. I watch them every single day, eat their own. And she's mm -hmm. truly, I mean, she's one of the more evil people in politics, considering she's been doing it for clearly thousands of years. Yeah, well said. Look, we, we have heard from Kamala Harris, who's yet to really detail any policies or even sit down for an interview since she became the presidential uh Democratic nominee, uh, but and so she'd of course have to be challenged if she was to go through an interview, something you'd kind of expect if she was going to to become the president. But one of the things we heard from her was her plans to bring in price controls to combat grocery prices. Take a listen. We believe in a future where we lower the cost of living for America's families. And when I am president, I will bring down the cost of groceries by making sure markets are competitive and fair. Again, Emily, she's pretending she's not in office right now. Yeah, not only does she pretend she's not in office, people forget because the past three and a half years, she's never made a public statement. She was in charge of the border, though, which we know has been the biggest disaster in history. I think in, uh, what, three and a half years, the only clip they have of her is talking about school buses. It was quite, it's funny because they were quick to, you know, erase that she was the border czar, but she was, and the border's yeah. never been worse. We have open borders. Um, I mean, everything with her is... I, I, it's scary that I feel like we're living an episode of South Park. You go on her, you go on her social media. She has 80 different pronouns and zero policies. It's the wild. only policy she does have was the one she stole from Trump, which of course the media, when Trump does it, it's bad. When she does it, it's good. It's so funny when people, people will defend her no matter what. They're like, so if you can do all these things, why have you not done them in the past three and a half years? But then these same people, when you talk about J.D. Vance and how much emphasis they put on him, who's actually fantastic and does do interviews and isn't scared of the media, which is crazy. Think about being scared of the media when every single media outlet is on your side. Yeah. Elon Musk invited her to do an interview. She said no. Trump did two and a half hours and was perfectly fine. She won't even do a scripted media outlet with her own people. It shows, cause she has no policies. Mm -hmm. She's a professional liar and she can't even do that well. Imagine this woman having the nuclear codes, genuinely, how scary that is for so, the rest of the world, not our countries. Uh, absolutely. And if you go on her campaign website, you can donate, you can buy merchandise, you can sign up to be informed, but there's not one policy that's outlined. Now uh, at the DNC, California governor, Gavin Newsom has defended Ended Kamala Harris for her lack of policies? We've not heard a ton of specifics from Democrats about Vice President Harris's uh, evolution on the issues over time. Isn't that a problem? Shocked? Are you shocked that in a convention you're not hearing a lot of specifics? It's been a month since oh, she on. took over. Come on. She'll have plenty of time to sort of map out more nuance. It's interesting, the host of the Benny Johnson show asked Kamala Harris supporters at the DNC convention in Chicago why they're supporting her. Many of them struggled to actually answer. Trump or Kamala, what do you think? Trump or Kamala Harris? Oh, God, it's uh, Kamala, definitely. Yes? A thousand percent. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite thing Kamala's done the last four years? Honestly? Yeah. Um, nah. <laughs> Actually, don't use this. Oh, Kamala. Kamala Harris. Yeah, Kamala. Kamala, why? Um, well, she's... Honestly, I don't know. Okay, she well, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not super knowledgeable, so I can't really speak too much on it. Because Trump sucks. Yeah, pretty much same thing. It says so much, doesn't it? So many people are just getting swept up in the hype, the campaign, and, and the BS. They don't even know why they like her. Well, it's funny because if you have no policies then how could you say you possibly support her? If you go online, here's the thing. 
No one likes Kamala. No one liked Joe Biden. They simply hate Trump. The difference is you could mm. ask the dumbest Trump supporters on the street and they would probably at least give you one to five policies or things he's done that they like, at least a direction he's going. These are truly the most low IQ voters. They are only voting for her because she's not Trump. And the sad thing is with the interviews, you're basically admitting that. And let's be real, the country, in, they managed to destroy the country in three and a half years. So I'm not sure what policy she's great. When she's talking about the price gouging and all these things, she literally is talking about communism. They're telling you to your face. She's not even able to do these things, but that is the direction they want to go. Mm -hmm. These people are socialists and they love communism. Yeah. A, a recent CBS News poll shows that Kamala Harris is leading Donald Trump by 12 points among female voters. 56 to 44, compared to Joe Biden's six-point lead in July at 49% to 43%. Emily, why are women flocking to support Kamala Harris? Is it because she is a woman, because she hasn't done any interviews, so she can't actually reveal uh, what she's like? Or is it because she's a Democrat and we're edging closer to polling day? Well, when you look at polls, you see that the group that votes the most left and is usually the most mentally ill and uninformed is single liberal women in America. So of course they're all voting for her because they've been brainwashed and fed, you know, fed Trump is bad and he's taking away women's rights, which is crazy. Trump has said he's not doing a nationwide abortion ban. He wants to protect IVF. He also wants to protect women from dangerous people coming into our country. And he also wants to keep men out of women's sports, but it's mm -hmm. so they're so brainwashed. They completely ignore all of that. And they're like, she's a woman. And I'm like, you know what? If you want a woman to be president, personally, I don't care. I don't think that's the most fitting role for a woman, but if that's what you want, how about an intelligent woman? If she's the president, she would put women back 50 plus years at least. I mean, it's an it's embarrassing. She truly is an embarrassment. I don't trust the polls in general, but I do know that is why women are voting for her. It's embarrassing, and it's embarrassing to watch all the women getting swept up in it just because she's a woman. Maybe we could look at her policies. Oh, that there aren't any available. Look, it looks like RFK Jr. will be dropping out of the race and will be throwing his support behind Donald Trump. This is what his running mate, Nicole Shanahan, had to say. There's two options that we're looking at, and one is staying in, forming that new party, but we run the risk of a Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris and, and Walt's uh, presidency because we draw votes from Trump or we draw somehow more votes from Trump or we walk away right now and join forces with, with Donald Trump. And Donald Trump says he's open to it. Can I ask you about RFK? Because just moments ago, his running mate said that they were considering endorsing you. Have you considered him for a role in the administration, and what role would that be? Well, we haven't, but I would love that endorsement because I've always liked him. Would you, would you also consider putting him in the administration? Uh, you're asking me a very unusual question. I haven't been asked that question yet. Uh, I like him a lot. I respect him a lot. Uh, I probably would if uh, something like that would happen. Uh, he's a uh, very different kind of a guy, a very smart guy. And yeah, I would be honored by that endorsement, certainly. Emily, I want to get your thoughts on what this will do to, to Trump's chances, I guess, but also what it says about the Democrats. Yeah, well, what it says about the Democrats is even traditionally libertarian people, and I consider myself middle on most subjects, have strayed from this party because this party is insane. This mm. went from the party that was anti-war. This administration has brought us into multiple wars, which we all believe under Trump would have never happened, which is ironic because yeah. these people still are protesting the wars, yet they want to go with the candidates who brought, in, who brought us into war. Um, that would have never happened under Trump. And it's so crazy because he even says this party is unrecognizable. I mean, this party is at the feet of the government. They want government to control our bodies, control our lives, all these things. He's like, and truly, it's not the party of love and tolerance. It's the party of anti-free speech. You know, no, you don't get to choose what you do with your body and medical freedom. And it's unrecognizable anymore. And this is like, honestly, the party of communism now. So, of course, the only thing that would make sense is for him to go and support Trump. And I will say as a very pro-Trump person, we love everyone with that's with RFK. We want yeah. the same things. 
we don't want forced vaccines and masks and lockdowns. And we want to have food and water that isn't po poison. And we want medical freedom. And we don't want people's licenses being stripped away for free speech, which comes out, you know, six months later, they were right. So I believe if we join forces, it's the best thing we can do. I have nothing but love and respect for him and his followers, and we welcome them with open arms. Emily Wilson, host of Emily Saves America. Thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Great to speak with you. Thank you so much. God bless. Well, anti-Israel protests have erupted out the front of the DNC, and this is how some activists clashed with police. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Filmmaker Ami Horowitz was there and he took over the microphone and chanted a message of support for Israel. My name is Ami. I gotta tell you right now. Our media has is to there be a difference between genocide Joe and Kamala Killer? No. no! Are you with the media? And who the people no, are we'll there? move back the then. You, you, can't, be, you can't be in front of the police. That's right. I got one thing to say to you people. I'm Israel, I'm Israel, I'm Israel, guy. Joining us now is Ami Horowitz. Ami, thank you for joining us. Well done. I don't think I'd be as brave as you to go out there and do what you did. Why did you feel it was so important to take over the microphone and what was the reaction? Yeah, there's a very fine line between bravery and stupidity. <laughs> uh, that might be me crossing over the line to stupidity if we're being totally honest and between friends here. Uh, look, it was important for me to make a, a point, a larger point here, right? Uh, these are a bunch of, let's, let's be frank, they're not pro-Palestinians. These are pro-Hamasniks. And they have a, um, look, they have a voice here. They're expressing their voice. And I want to make my voice clear as well. Uh, they're not just trying to save children in Gaza. Right? Let's be clear about this. That's fine. We can have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. These are people who want to support Hamas and see the destruction of the state of Israel and writ large, the destruction of the Jewish people. And I wanted to make sure they understood that there are other voices out there. And uh, yeah, I sang a, a very old pro-Jewish, pro-Israel chant. The words meant, my nation lives. And uh, yeah, wanted to make clear they knew that people like us were out there. I wasn't gonna let what they are saying stand on its own. Well done. You've been calling out some of the disgusting anti-Semitic messages that have been spreading at these protests. In your opinion, in your observations, are the protests getting worse? Look, what we're seeing here is a preview of what the Democratic Party is moving towards, right? They're not currently a majority of the Democratic Party. Let's be clear. They are a minority, but a growing minority. Uh, the problem is, is that you have the Democratic Party, the Democratic leadership, abetting these people, right? You, we just saw uh, we just saw Joe Biden. I mean, when they wheeled him out at 3:30 uh, in the morning to give uh, his speech, uh, what did he say? He said uh, these people have important points to make. Really, I'd like to know which point it was that they were making that he agrees with. Is it the destruction of state of Israel? Is it burning down the DNC? Is it the fact they kept calling, they're calling him Genocide Joe and her <laughs> killer Kamala? By the way, I want to make something very clear. I know she's kowtowing these people, and so is he, but if they think they're going to win over their votes, they're wrong. I spent several days with these protesters. I spoke with them. Mm. I asked them questions. They are not going to support Kamala, and they're not supporting the Democratic Party. None of them. So if they think that by throwing Israel under the bus and then backing the bus over Israel, they're going to win Michigan or Georgia because both those places have large Arab voters, they are very, very mistaken. And the problem is, is they're, they're allowing these people to grow. It's Again, it's a, it's a very fast-growing segment, the Democratic Party. And if you want to see what the Democratic Party will look like in, let's say, five years, maybe less, just look at England and look at the Labour Party. See what they look like when it comes to Israel and anti-Semitism? And that's a preview of what the Democratic Party is becoming and where it's heading towards. Well, let's take a look at what's been happening at the DNC. This is what former U.S. President Barack Obama had to say. We do not need four more years of bluster and bumbling 
and chaos. We have seen that movie before, and we all know that the sequel is usually worse. Why are the Democrats so obsessed with targeting Donald Trump? Oh, you were talking about Donald Trump? I thought you were talking about uh, Joe Biden. Sorry. The, the, <laughs> the bubbly incompetence got me confused. I, I didn't know who he was talking about. Well, it's wild, um, isn't it? Four more years? It's like, why is he making that point? Yeah. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, look, uh, the truth is, is that if, if you really asked Barack Obama what he really thought of Joe Biden, those words were actually the, be exactly that's his answer. Biden. Let's be honest. <laughs> Um, no, of course they're upset. They're they're obsessed with with Donald Trump because um, he he. It's, it's funny. Donald Trump has made significant inroads into a lot of their Democratic base, right? And they're scared of that. They're scared of the erosion of their own base. Um, if you look at the black voting, if you look at clearly Hispanic voting, even look at the at the labor unions. Um, these are all areas which have been the backbone of the Democratic Party, which have been eroding because Donald Trump is actually speaking to their issues. Now, when I say their issues, it's so funny. I was in an a, a Uber ride from Chicago, and I was talking to a, my, a black woman who was my Uber rider, and we were talking about politics. She kind of whispered to me. She said, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. You know why? Because Donald Trump isn't speaking to black issues. What are black issues and Hispanic issues? American issues. Yeah. That's what they care about. They care about inflation. They care about the border. They care about crime. Democrats understand those are the three major issues facing our country. Total fail under Joe Biden and success under Donald Trump. Yeah. That's why they're obsessed. They have to find a way to blunt his move toward that base. And right now, yeah, Kamala may have had, it's a bit of a sugar high, I think, and he's, she certainly built up a little bit more of where she was with that, with those voting bases. But I think ultimately it's going to go back down to where it was. It will go back down to the mean. And I think they're frightened. And they should be. Well, to your point, it's been revealed that the U.S. added far less jobs than what was initially reported, according to new figures released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Total employment in March was more than 800,000 lower than what had been reported. That is a massive difference. A million jobs here, a million jobs there. So all of a sudden we're talking about real numbers, right? Yeah, a million jobs is a lot of jobs for you to kind of hide in the paperwork and say we created them when in reality they were never there, right? No, it's a big deal. And uh, it does speak to a larger issue on the complicity of these numbers, of the people compiling these numbers. Um, you know, it was very convenient that when they were trying, they were in a, in a dogfight with Donald Trump, those jobs somehow were created. By the way, I also want to point out that, yes, there has been job growth, but the vast majority of job growth in this country has been in the public sector and in healthcare. Those are the major places where the job growth has been, where the government has been doling out money, by the way, compounding inflation, because we can, as we expand government, obviously, we're spending more of our taxpayer dollars, which increases inflation, and we increase the entire cycle. Um, and by the way, also, when now those jobs suddenly, they appeared at one point, now they've disappeared. You know what that's going to do? That's going to create pressure on the Fed to reduce interest rates at a time where people are saying interest rates are too high. And all of a sudden, right before the election, mm -hmm. interest rates are coming down. Easy money is going to be coming back. By the way, obviously going to compound inflation, but that's down the line. They're not worried about that three, four months from now. They're never worried. The Democrats are never worried about what's going to go on in the future. They're worried about the moment. They're in the moment. And they're looking to reduce interest rates so people can pay less money their mortgage, feel like they have some more money. All of a sudden, magically, it's all going to come together for the election. Um, before I let you go, I want to quickly look at Donald Trump's campaign. This week, he indicated if he's elected, doctors could be charged for performing surgeries on minors without parental consent. This is to protect children from sexual mutilation, he says. Do you welcome this? I mean, you know, it's so funny. You know, people ask me why I do the videos that I do. And really, it's about trying to influence the centre and the centre-left. Mm. Now, if I tell people on the centre, centre-left that... Um, that the debt that the hard left wants to trans children, they look at me, they go, that's not true. Nobody wants to trans children. That is not a thing. You know, I did a video, Gabriela, where I went out and I had a hidden cameras, I had a petition for a fictitious four-year-old that wanted to have no, medical surgery transition for a man to a woman. And you know what? 
all of these leftist students sign my petition. It's a thing, right? Yeah. And yeah, look, we there has to be a, a price to be paid when a child wants to have invasive medical surgery that cannot be reversed. Yes, there needs to be a, a toll to pay because that's not the way this should work, right? When Walt said, I love it when they had that whole debate um, and they were talking about how Walt was talking about taking children away from people who didn't want their children to transition who were underage. And they kept saying like, you know, the, the left was saying, that's not true. That's not, it is true. Yeah. I looked at, I went, look, sometimes what we say on the right isn't true. Or they say the left isn't true. <laughs> I like to dig into the details. I looked into it. No, the courts could actually take your child away. They were trying to push this through. They did, thankfully. But they're trying to push it through so you could take a child away. That's the reality. And yes, I think there should be a penalty. Ami, well done and well said. Keep up the great work. And thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Always my pleasure. As we just heard from Ami Horowitz, the anti-Israel protests out the front of the DNC in Chicago spiralled out of control this week. I'm a white woman in between and then another white dude right there. That's how we do it. White power. Last time I saw you, you got some DC. Joining us is Joel Burney from the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council. Joel, thank you for your time. I really hate starting almost every interview now with grabs of some of the disgusting anti-Semitic displays that are, that are occurring in all parts of the world, but it's just not going away. Can I get your reaction to the protests out the front of the DNC? Well, we're, we're, we're 10 months after the horrific events of October 7 and... Uh, Continuously, we're seeing in Western democratic uh, societies and countries, including our own here in Australia, have been subjected to uh, immense disruption uh, and protest uh, from a very vicious, uh, very well organized, very well funded uh, and highly coordinated protest movement. Where, unfortunately, after so long, Gabriella, I'm at a loss to know exactly what their demands are. So you mm -hmm. see here the images of protesting outside of the, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, uh, where you've had speeches from President Biden already over the past couple of days, which if you were look at it from an analysis point of view on the position of the Middle East, uh, is, is a, it was certainly not uh, um, favourable towards Israel. Um, so you can see that they're already caving to, to lots of different measures and demands of this protest group, but it just doesn't seem... Uh, to satisfy them. And, and my point would strongly be that you will not be able to satisfy them. Uh, you will give this group an inch and they will take and demand a mile. Um, and the, in the behaviour, of this is the pursuit of your ends, this is the pursuit of your political demands, that you need to protest, you need to uh, break through barricades, you need to attack and, and assault police officers. Uh, it's, it's just ridiculous. And I think not just... Uh, uh, in uh, in countries like the United States, Canada, and other Western European countries, I think that Australians have had a gut full of this type of behaviour as well. Mm, absolutely, and this has been going on while we've had some sad news out of the Middle East just earlier this week. The bodies of six Israeli hostages who were abducted by terrorists on October 7, including one person who was presumed to have been alive, were recovered in an overnight operation in Khan Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip. Has this ramped up calls for all of the hostages to be released? Well, unfortunately, Gabrielle, I think that the, the plight of the hostages has been one of these very important uh, uh, plot lines and, and narrative lines of this conflict that has been missed, not just by our government, but other governments around the world. Um, we now are down, out of the 250-odd that were taken hostage on October 7, we're now down to about 110 remaining of which the Israeli Defence Forces believe that at least 34 um, are, are deceased. Uh, my suggestion would be, unfortunately, that that number would be much larger. Um, so the Australian people would understand that if you take a number of our citizens and keep them captive without access to the Red Cross, without access to medical care, uh, without access to anyone to even know if they're dead or alive, um, this, is, this has tortured uh, the nation of Israel uh, since the horrific events on October 7, and on a daily basis, um, they consistently traumatised and tortured uh, with not knowing exactly what's uh, what's going on uh, with these poor hostages. So the, the, the Israeli public is certainly in favour of a ceasefire deal 
that will see the release of those sausages. It appears very clearly over the very intense diplomatic efforts over the past week or two that Israel has agreed to the position of the Biden administration in the United States and the other negotiating parties, uh, including the Qataris and the Egyptians, and appears as though, again, it's Hamas, the terror organization that started all this chaos and this mess, that is again dragging its feet, saying no to the conditions, saying no to uh, the ceasefire deal. And we're at this juncture where uh, Israel recovers six bodies, one of which they thought was still alive. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, as, as we know, um, uh, was found uh, deceased. Yeah, just, just more heartbreak. US President Joe Biden reportedly underscored the importance of finalising a hostage deal in a phone call with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ahead of anticipated high-level talks in Cairo. The White House said the president stressed the urgency of bringing the ceasefire and hostage release deal to closure and discussed upcoming talks in Cairo to remove any remaining obstacle. Joel, uh, are we any closer? Look, it's a tough question, Gabriella. Um, as, a, as I stated before, there's been immense diplomatic uh, activity going on over the past week. So uh, uh, Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Blinken, was in Israel uh, over the past couple of days, and, and there's been a lot of uh, diplomacy, a lot of shuttling here and there, with the hope that talks will resume in either Cairo or Doha within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, this is all, wait, this has all happened before, Gabriella. So to say, suggest that, you know, this... This uh, continued repeat behaviour is going to somehow usher a deal closer and closer. It's mm -hmm. very hard to, to tell because we just don't know. From what we're getting in media reports, um, there is a, a difference of opinion from the accepted position of the Israelis uh, to what's uh, called bridging uh, conditions that were trying to bring the parties together over the past week. The Israelis have agreed to, to those uh, uh, proposals by the, led by the United States. Um, it's Hamas. Um, that, is, that, that is dragging its feet and, and not doing it. Now, but with all due respect uh, to, to President Biden and the United States administration, there's a lot going on domestically in the United States. You've got the DNC, um, you've got a rejuvenated candidate on the Democratic side, and you have a general election coming up in November. So the desire for the administration to pursue a ceasefire deal at all costs is critically important to the United States administration, and we can all understand that. Yeah. However, the Prime Minister in Israel has other considerations to take into account when agreeing to this deal, and that is the safety of his citizens. Uh, this deal, just because the United States wants it and wants it now, cannot uh, continue the security situation in the south for the residents of Israel. Um, we've gone into, they've gone in. Uh, it's been a difficult war. Uh, they have reached significant uh, a positive war ends and and gains, uh, but the job is very close to being done, but it is not yet done. So I would have concerns that uh, the international community pressures Israel and twists Israel's arm and places pressure on Israel to agree to conditions where Hamas remains in power, for instance, which is something that the international community promised Israel uh, would not happen. And I believe that the demand of Israel to make sure that it can maintain some type of security control ongoing to protect its own citizens is not only valid and justified, but I think that its allies, including the United States, and hopefully, you know, whatever's left of the alliance between Australia and, and uh, Israel, that the Australian government can get behind such things as well. Looking at the situation here in Australia, Sky News host Harry Markson revealed that police sources in New South Wales are highly concerned that the Albanese government may have given visas to Hamas supporters, saying inadequate security checks could put community safety at risk. Security sources told Sky News that far more rigorous background checks were done on the young children of ISIS brides than Palestinians arriving in Australia from a terrorist hotspots. Can I get your thoughts on, on this, on this job? So obviously this has been developing over the past uh, fortnight of the parliamentary sitting period. Um, all I can say is, is that I know uh, very, well, we all know collectively little um, to make an informed judgment is difficult because there seemingly is a lack of transparency coming from the government and exactly what procedures were implemented in issuing these visas. Now, from what we understand, uh, these, these uh, refugees from Gaza came out on visitors' visas. It is still unclear as to why they were granted visitors' visas where the, where the precedent of bringing in refugees from conflict zones was to offer them a special visa status where... Certain checks could be done in third-party countries, biometric uh, testing and, and, and records could be maintained, and those security checks could be done 
in a formal uh, and uh, and uh, and it could be processed offshore before granting the visa to allow those refugees onshore. Now, critically, Gabriella, it's really important that the, this debate should not be about whether or not Australia is is either sympathetic or opens its doors to refugees. We understand that it is a conflict zone, and there is the, the plight of the Palestinian people is real, even though it is clearly our position. Uh, and I would stress this: that this is all due to uh, the actions of Hamas. Uh, that rules that enclave. Uh, but to, to suggest that, so we, we accept that Australia has a humanitarian uh, ability to help people in need, and that mm-hmm. should be done so. But it should certainly not be done so at the, firstly and foremostly, at the expense of our national security. And secondly, should not imperil our national security for uh, potential domestic gains or p- domestic political gains, as has been uh, insinuated in this case from the government. So I think the government had the opportunity to come clean about exactly how the process uh, happened and why and whether or not departmental advice differed from the process that they had agreed to do, um, but they haven't done so. So I think question time has been quite a bit of back and forward uh, with questions from the from the opposition uh, with little information coming from the government. But I see that this story will continue uh, over the coming days because uh, the information that is being uh, requested is, is not overly forthcoming. Joel Burney, Executive Manager of the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council. Thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Thank you, Gabriella. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have returned from their unofficial tour of Colombia, but the four-day visit has been unsurprisingly polarising. Joining us is Riley Sullivan, who is a brilliant reporter here at skynews.com.au. Riley, the Sussexes have just returned from another royal tour that's not a royal tour, this Mm -hmm. time to Colombia. How did the trip pan out? Right, well, this trip was, as expected, um, very polarising, as you said. You know, we saw Harry and Meghan travelling all over Colombia. Um, They were accompanied by the Vice President, Francia Marquez. They went to Bogota, they went to Cali. Um, They went to a place called San Basilio... um, de Palenque, which is a historic town linked to slavery and the end of the slave Mm. trade. And so a very sombre uh, trip as well. It wasn't just, you know, all fun photo ops. But um, I think the public relations side of it has been pretty positive for the Sussexes. You know, there's been a heap of coverage of it, very much like the Nigeria trip, looking very royal, very official. But um, certainly, you know, it it was polarising. Okay. And during one of the Sussexes stops Mm -hmm. in Colombia, locals told reporters that they hoped that Harry and Meghan would apologise for Mm. the royal family's links to slavery. Has the royal family reacted to the comments? Is it a sign of of things to come? Mm, This is very... This is challenging because, obviously, uh, all monarchies around the world are grappling with how do they kind of come to terms with their historical ties to slavery. Really, the only major monarchy is the Netherlands that have publicly apologised for their um, historical links to slavery. But, as you said, um, when they were in Colombia, in San Basilio, Um, there were some local people that were calling on Harry and Meghan to make an apology for slavery. Obviously, the history of Colombia is Spanish colonialism, so it was kind of an awkward um, comment, but you can understand that they're coming from a place of of seeing these, you know, um, these royal European figureheads coming to their country and they're probably seeing a disconnect. Um, I think for King Charles, this is really concerning. You know, the royal family itself is still as I said, working out how they're going to approach this issue. Um, right. Charles certainly hasn't apologised for slavery. He's he's expressed sorrow for slavery, which is a huge step forward than what, say, Queen Elizabeth has said, but he certainly hasn't really um, got to that point. So he will be looking at this and thinking, you know, this is just another reason why Harry and Meghan shouldn't be doing these unofficial trips because, you know, inadvertently, even if they say they're there as Harry and Meghan and not as the royal family, they're being sort of questioned on these big issues that, frankly, I don't think they can handle. Yeah, that's a fair point. Look, sources close to Prince William say that he's furious with Harry and Meghan for not respecting Princess Catherine's wishes. Mm -hmm. What request is he referring to? Mm, So we understand now that, you know, Harry and Meghan's relationship with Kate and William is pretty much broken down. Um, Any correspondence they do have is is just that. It's official correspondence. And um, it was an interesting one, you know, Princess Catherine in her personal life, we know her as Kate, we love her as Kate, but in her personal life she prefers to be called Catherine, that's obviously her full name. Um, And and she has expressed that to family and friends that for over a decade now that she likes to be called Catherine. And Mm -hmm. um, Harry and Meghan have continuously, you know, called her Kate. Like, you can even remember the Oprah interview 
when Megan famously brought up the whole weighty Katie comment, which was very offensive. Um, she yeah. called her Kate several times in that interview. And allegedly, you know, even as recently as since Princess Catherine's been diagnosed with cancer, they've sent letters to, to the princess calling her Kate again. And William in particular is just infuriated by this because I think that, you know, granted, you know, Catherine's got a lot on her plate at the moment. I don't think she's too concerned about it. But for William, I think it just digs at him because Absolutely. we know that Meghan herself, I guess the hypocrisy of it is she is very sensitive about her titles. Like with the media, she likes to be Meghan Duchess of Sussex, nothing more, nothing less. So it's kind of funny that, you know, she's very sensitive about that, but apparently not so much with her sister-in-law. Of course not. No, it, uh, sadly, it does not surprise me. This week, we found out that King Charles has terminated the security team stationed at Prince Andrew's home, Royal Lodge. Is this a sign that the Duke of York could be evicted? I think we've called this for months now. You know, mm. this is just another sign. I think that Andrew and his ex-wife, uh, Fergie, they're on the way out. I think that this is a pretty significant move by the King. It goes to show that, you know, if there's no security force around the Royal Lodge, I mean, effectively, there's no plans for it to be used as a royal residence for the time being. So I would, if I was Andrew, I'd be looking at, I don't know, um, the real estate websites, like I'd be looking for rentals or an Airbnb because um, from the looks of it, they're going to be without security in December. Wow. OK. Riley mm. Sullivan, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be back. That is Power Hour. Thank you for your company. We'll see you next week. Make sure you subscribe to Sky News Australia on YouTube.